Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Chan Kok Ju, who is going to share with us an interesting case uh, where we'd like to uh, pick your brains and get you to think about the underlying diagnosis. Um, uh, Dr. Chan Kok Ju is um, a pediatrician um, and in the Department of uh, Pediatrics, University of Malaya Medical Center. Um, he, is, um, he is now trained to be a neonatologist uh, and he is uh, where he's actively in our neonatal intensive care unit as a pediatric um, uh, neonatology fellow. Uh, so I, without further ado, I'd like um, to call upon Dr. Chan Kok Ju to share with us uh, a case with this presentation entitled An Unusual Neonatal Abdominal Cyst. Dr. Chan. Thank you very much, Prof. Asana, for the very kind introduction. I'm Kok Ju here from the Pediatrics Department. In following with our theme of congenital abnormalities today, we are very thankful for the organizing committee to provide us a chance to share about a patient we encountered about two years ago who had quite an unusual abdominal cyst. Our patient was a baby boy, uh, late preterm at 36 weeks, two days. The mother underwent a caesarean section due to pre-labor, pre-labor, uh, pre preterm rupture of membranes. At that juncture, the birth parameters, birth weight was 3.295 kilos. It was otherwise appropriate for gestational age. Mother was 33 years old. This was her second pregnancy. And throughout this pregnancy, she had issues with pregnancy-induced hypertension and had preeclampsia at 34 weeks. Uh, there was also maternal obesity with a BMI of 36. She had bronchial asthma, but otherwise it was well-controlled. Uh, three years prior to this pregnancy, she had miscarriage at six weeks period of abenoria, but did not require any dilatation of curvature. And the main point of interest here was during her fetal scans. It was noted that she had a fetal right pelvic cyst, as well as polyhydromyos. A summary of the fetal scans is as shown. During her very initial detailed scan at 26 weeks, it was reported to be normal. However, then things took a turn when at 34 weeks, it was noted that she had quite significant abdominal cysts at the right posterior upper quadrant, measuring around 6 centimeters times 5 centimeters times 4 centimeters. And there was features to suggest ascites. Amniotic fluid index at the juncture was still normal. However, over the next two weeks, the AFI was increased before delivery. It was at 34, centi 34 centimeters, which is way above the 99th centile. Coming back at the angle scan, as we could see here, this is a single, uh, single kidney, a uh, sing single uh, cyst arising probably from the right kidney, with this being the liver. At the juncture, reviewing the previous images, it does not look complex. It does not look loculated and there was no septal sin. So the juncture, she was managed as an antenatally diagnosed renal cyst. Intrapartum, at day one of life, baby was born vigorous with good up gas scores. In the first minute, it was seven, and in the fifth minute, it was nine. He was not the small thing. However, the main concern was a grossly distended abdomen, and it was tense with ascites. The patient also had respiratory distress, despite otherwise clear lung views, and required non-invasive ventilation in the form of pipette, which we postulated was due to diaphragmatic splinting by this distended abdomen. Other systemic examination was otherwise normal, and we consulted our uncalled pediatric surgery colleagues in which a CBD was inserted, which showed satisfactory urine output. Initial investigation showed renal function with a urea of 3.2. The creatinine is on 97 micromoles per liter, which is on the higher side. However, the caveat is that this is taken within the first 48 hours of life, and sometimes it can be a result of methanol creatinine values. 
tumor markers was also sent in which the alpha fetoprotein may seem astonishingly high at 78,000. But to share with the audience in the neonatal period, it's been known that the alpha fetoprotein may have quite sky high values up to 100,000 at times. The HCG is 139. Uh, the normal reference ranges that we found, and this is based on very small studies, is less than 50. But against authors of the references did mention that HCG is quite time sensitive and quite often is due to transplacental uh, rather than a true HCG secreting tumor. But the gist of this tumor markers at a glance are more useful if there's a serial marker rather than a one off result. Otherwise, liver function and blood counts was satisfactory. Our blood pouches yielded no growth, and our workup for other intrauterine infections, such as torches and parvovirus, was unremarkable. So this patient underwent an urgent ultrasound abdomen, which shows a right-sided, well-defined cystic abdominal lesion, 4.9 times 4.1 times 5.1 centimeter. Again, there were concerns for ascites with free fluids at the perihepatic, the paracolic gutter, and the pelvic regions. There was a thickened urinary bladder wall. However, at that juncture, was not able to visualize any dilated posterior urethra. By the second day of life, as the patient was still in respiratory distress and on BiPAP, which we couldn't win, the patient was then subjected for an urgent CT abdomen in which the initial report showed a large right, right retroperitoneal cystic lesion with communication to the right renal calyces, a left hydronephrosis, a bilateral hydrourethra, as well as bladder wall ticket. So what we did at a child who is distressed with what we thought was a abdominal cyst causing respiratory distress, along with the surgeons and the aid of our interventional radiology colleague, an emergent abdominal drain was performed under ultrasound guidance. And this is when the mystery deepens. We actually got 500 mils of clear urine out. And the patient did improve with abdominal distension and respiratory distress getting better. We were able to win our support. And in, in, after CTE imaging and abdominal drain insertion, we've consulted our pediatric urology team. And now we would like to show the CT images, which we thought was quite interesting and a good learning point for all of us. So if I have a look at the CT image in the coronal view, as shown on the white arrow hits here, we can see on the right side, this is the large retroperitoneal encapsulated homogeneous cystic collection. In the CT is about six times five times seven centimeters. We think that it's arising from the posterior lateral aspect of the right kidney, and we think that the, right, the remaining right kidney is otherwise distorted. On the other side, we can see that there is left hydronephrosis with pelvic callistasis as well as callicastasis, and it gives rise to a very nice clover leaf appearance, suggested that probably the dilatation was well distributed in the pelvic callistial system. And as we go down the CT scan images, as we've seen in the black arrows here, we can see that there's actually bilateral hydroureter, which suggests that there might be a distal obstructive neuropathy. If we move on to the psychical images, the focus here will be at the bladder wall. As you can see from this white arrow, this is the thickening of the urinary bladder. And if we can follow the thickening, it even extends to the prostatic portion of the urethra. On the CT scan as well, there was concerns about free fluids in the peritoneum, which we thought was a situs, as shown by the asterisk here. Now, for our axial view, essentially we show this right uh, retroperitoneal collection with extra peritoneal fluid extrapolating into the peritoneal planes. And you can see in this white arrow, it's actually re reaching recesses of the lesser sac. And it's actually shown here the bare area of the liver. And the black arrow here actually shows visualization of the falciform ligament. So to add spice into the presentation, uh, Mr. Hafiz, if you, mind, if you do not mind, do you mind starting the poll for this? So we thought of doing a quiz to ask what is the diagnosis for this patient so that the audience can have a 
share of our adventure when we encountered this child. So in summary, we had a non-dysmorphic 36-weeker baby boy with a good weight who presented with a very tense abdominal distension causing respiratory distress due to splinting. We noted there was a massive right renal cyst since the antenatal scans, and it was seems to be growing quite fast because the first scan was normal and subsequent scans within the next four to six weeks showed the cyst. The images from the CT abdomen showed a large retroperitoneal homogeneous cystic connection at the posterior lateral aspect of the right kidney with bilateral hydroureter nephrosis and a cytosis. So the question that we were faced is, what do we think was the diagnosis? Is it A, a right multicystic dysplastic kidney with bilateral hydroureteral nephrosis? Is it, are we dealing with a right pyonephrosis with bilateral PUJ obstruction? Was this a massive right retroperitoneal lymphatic malformation? Or is it a right renal urinoma? A urinoma being an extravasated urine collection due to a posterior urethral valve. So we'll give a minute for the polls to run and then we'll check on the results. All right. All right. So thank you very much for sharing uh, the, your opinions on it. As we can see, this is not an easy uh, diagnosis to make. So uh, okay, right. So a good majority voted around 50% for the urinoma. A good proportion also were concerned that this was a right multicystic dysplastic kidney. So to continue on with the plot of the story and to reveal the mystery. Sorry. Okay. In view of the presence of a distal obstructive urology, we further investigated this child with a micturating cystoureograph. And it is here that probably we get something more usual that we see. So a run through of this is, as we can see from starting with the white arrowheads here, this is suggestive of bladder neck hypertrophy with shouldering being demonstrated. At the black arrows here, we can show that the urethral in the urethra area, the prostatic portion is dilated. And along the white arrow track here, there was persistent filling defect. And from this, we identified that the patient actually has a posterior urethral valve. So the final diagnosis, as the majority of the audience got it, was a right urinoma with obstructive uropathy due to a posterior urethral valve. And we postulated that the ascites that has been reported was probably extravasated urine. Now, thankfully, this patient was able to graduate an ICU later on quite smoothly. By the third day of life, the abdominal drain was removed. By the sixth day of life, the patient underwent cystoscopy, followed by definitive management with PUV palpation. And we were able to discharge the patient home at day 12 of life. At the juncture, Medications that was provided to the patient included cefuroxime as prophylaxis, alpha blockers in the form of terazosin for bladder neck uh, hypertrophy, uh, anticholinergics propivirin was given for thickened bladder wall. And in the subsequent of the follow-up, the child is now about one year, eight months. The weight is 10.2 kilos on the 10 center line. She is a bit on the shorter side at 77.5 centimeters, centimeters below the third centiles. This patient has had multiple episodes of UTIs. However, the renal function was acceptable based on the latest result with a creatinine of 47 and a urea of 3.5. On functional scans, the latest DMSA showed that there is left kidney, upper and lower pole cortical scarring, but otherwise left differential function was still satisfactory. The right kidney is smaller with reduced right uh, differential function, but no obvious cortical scarring. Therefore, we are very fortunate that we have been able to publish this case in the Journal of Pediatrics. In the similar vein, we also showed this case to an international audience. And again, diagnosis is not always straightforward. Hence, leading to our discussion. What exactly is a urinoma? So urinoma is extra, essentially an encapsulated, extravasated urine, which is due to a destruction of the 
survival of urinary collecting system anywhere from the calyx to the urethra. And it's usually contained within a fibrous pseudocapsule. We want to highlight to the audience that this is rare. The purported pathophysiology behind it is that it is a product of an obstructive neuropathy in which essentially there's a rupture in the urine collecting system as a pop-off mechanism to, uh, uh, as, the, as the system is not able to compensate for the high backflow pressures. This condition not just occurs in intrauterine in the neonatal period, but it may also occur in older children and adults as a sequelae to trauma, surgery, or any injury to the urinary collecting duct. The gist of what we learned is that if we are ever dealing with a renal cyst, which is sudden and increasing in size with associated obstructive neuropathy, that's when the consideration of urinoma should be made. Other non-renal newborn abdominal cysts that might present with a large cyst also includes in the GI system and direct duplication cysts, which is essentially an embryonic abnormality leading to a cyst in the uh, GI system, or it could be a macrodium pseudocyst, although those are much more in the sick, sicker units who has had an episode of meconium peritonitis, was in the verge of recovering where they noted that they had intestinal obstruction, find, followed by finding a discovery of a cyst. And for female babies, it will be ovarian cysts. After learning about this case, we did through, we went through literature review and not surprisingly, it was mostly on case reports and case series. But we started reflecting on maybe what we could have done better with this baby. A few things we have learned on our reflection is that number one, when it comes to imaging, that urinomas can be diagnosed with either ultrasonography or CT scan. So the point that we like to make is that if we talk about urinomas, an ultrasonography may be good enough for diagnosis and to uh, vaccinate further management. Therefore, there is a role to actually avoid the CT scan if possible, which we can then avoid radiation and transport risk, which is significant in pediatric population and even more substantial in the newborn. The second consideration we, we were discussing was about emergent management. In a clinical situation whereby there is an excess, a collection, a cyst that is causing organ compression or causing splinting to the, uh, the respiratory system, it is very tempting as clinician for us to pull the trigger, put in the drain and remove whatever is causing the obstruction, which is what we did for this patient. However, on hindsight, perhaps we could have considered a different approach to this matter, as there is a role for immediate suprapubic catheterization followed by urgent PUV fulguration versus a CBD and an abdominal drain insertion. If we are looking at SPC versus CBD alone, do note that CBD can be potentially difficult as it may coil up due to the PUV rather than entering and probably draining the bladder. And the SPC can be actually accessible in the neonatal period because the bladder is more on the abdomen rather than the pelvic cavity. And the SPC would provide an avenue in which a follow-up with an on-table cystogram could be performed, which would then make the diagnosis of PUV and bladder neck hypertrophy. And ultimately, the SPC would probably avoid disrupting surrounding anatomy, which may then complicate definitive treatment, which is a risk with inserting a CPD. So the combination of SPC plus PUV vibration that may give rise to a possibility that it itself may have relieved the urinoma, plus providing definitive treatment to the cause of the PUV. Therefore, it may obviate a need for putting in an abdominal drain because any attempts to drain the urinoma or any intracystic fluid for that matter may have a risk of causing peritoneal spillage and increasing the risk of intra-abdominal sepsis. To dovetail this presentation at the end, we thought of sharing some information on the prognosis. So this is coming from an American case series of 25 patients. In their series, around 15 cases of 60%, the urinoma was on the right side, which is similar to uh, what we have seen. And one case was actually a bilateral urinoma. Etiologies are uh, shown in their case series. A good proportion of it is due to uteral pelvic junction obstruction, 
and another seven cases was due to PUV. But around 20% of the cases, there was no clear uh, etiology of the obstruction ever being determined. In their series, six cases were electively terminated, with the main reason due to a uh, lack of residual kidney seen in the antenatal scans. But otherwise, for the remaining cases, the, uh, the average gestation age was fairly satisfactory with a, uh, with a mean at 37 weeks and a range of 33 to 40 weeks POA. So mostly on the late preterm to term deliveries. The average birth weight was about 3.191 kilo, which is quite uh, decent as well. However, there was two neonatal deaths after birth being reported, both of whom had anhydramnios just before delivery. And this is where we differ because our patient has had polyhydramnios. But the presence of an anhydramnios is a very ominous sign that you have essentially a non-functioning kidney at the very end of the pregnancy. Four cases that underwent in fetal intervention and drainage. And ultimately, long-term prognosis depends on the severity of the genital urinary abnormalities and what the residual urinal functions are. And we hope to follow up with our patient to see the progress. With that, I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask and share in our adventure with this patient. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chan, um, uh, for a brilliant presentation. Uh, now, we have a few um, uh, questions. Okay. Um, okay. Prof. Tunku Sarah actually asked about uh, what is PUV fulguration? And um, uh, also asked, very lucky not to get infective peritonitis. Uh, hi, Prof. Yeah. Yes, so the PU, uh, the fulguration would be a procedure whereby the urethral valves are addressed, and therefore, with the uh, dilatation of the valve, the uh, distal uropathy can be overcome. We are, uh, once, one of the reasons why we felt we a lot from this case is yes, as how Prof. Tungku Sarah mentioned, we are fortunate we did not get an infective peritonitis uh, with this patient. Hence, one of the learning points was regarding the urgency to put in the drain is something that we have reflected quite heavily on. The patient uh, was then continued on prophylactic antibiotics. Okay. Um, uh, you probably asked uh, Dr. Chan, could you explain why the mum had polyhydramnios? Uh, the fetal ability to swallow is not impaired here, so the mum should be able to empty the amniotic fluid regularly. If anything, the mum should get low amniotic volume. Thanks, Prof. Chan. I've tried read, uh, performing a literature review on this matter, but there was no definitive answers I could find. In my look into patients with uh, uh, urinomas in the neonatal period, there was postulations that some patients actually compensate by generating more urine, which then contributes to the polyhydramnios. But on the other end of the spectrum, which is what we usually know, it's that with enough renal insults, the urine output should be reducing, which is what the case series that I presented mentioned. If there's a reducing AFI and anhydramnios, then the situations becomes more ominous for the patient. But there are isolated cases which also brought up an AFI, uh, an erase of AFI. But our patient was quite abnormally high, actually, even compared to the other uh, readings I've made. Because the highest I've read, I think, was AFI of around 31 for a 37-weaker baby. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Chan. I think um, Prof. Mary Merritt actually um, asked uh, a question about antenatal diagnosis. Um, so what is the recommended management if a large abdominal cyst is diagnosed antenatally? Uh, so Prof. Mary, to answer that question, um, 
I think firstly is to identify what sort of cysts do we think we are dealing with. Invariably, probably this patient may have benefited from a prenatal uh, uh, discussion in which uh, the pediatric surgery team may have been highlighted earlier. Uh, depending on the location of the abdominal cyst and its origin, then it will allow us to plan out managements much smoother when the patient is then delivered. Yeah, so that's, that's indeed correct, actually. Um, uh, I think the main thing about any abdominal cyst, I mean, if I just may add uh, to Dr. Chan's uh, reply, is actually a multidisciplinary team management uh, to try and ascertain what could be the possible cause. And I think in this case, I mean, there was a high suspicion that it's most likely related to renal because there was bilateral involvement. Um, uh, I think the, uh, actually, Mr. Hari mentioned that he would like to uh, have a comment on this case. Yeah, so Mr. Hari um, was, I mean, is our pediatric um, urologist and he was very much involved um, uh, towards the later management of this case. Uh, and maybe is Mr. Hari there? Um, yeah, I mean, comment? yeah, yeah. Okay. Hi, hi. Hi. Uh, this is a response to the uh, question of just about antenatal diagnosis. Uh, we are actually working with uh, uh, Prof. Wally and uh, the, the ONG now. So when they find any sort of dilatation, they do call upon us and then uh, we go down and discuss with them. We're trying to change the, um, uh, uh, the grading system which they use to actually uh, uh, come up with a conclusion. And um, uh, we actually counsel the parents uh, before they're born as, uh, as well. So we are, we are quite up there with the, the antenatal uh, diagnosis. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hari. Yeah, so that's... Um, uh, okay, I'll just go through and just make sure that there are no more questions. Actually, there were two more questions uh, for earlier, but I think what I can... From earlier about... Um, Okay, that's fine. I think there are no more questions, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So there, I think there are no more questions. Uh, but before I sum up, uh, I think there the are two cases that we, um, the Department of yes, upon one, upon the many uh, congenital anomalies related to um, kidneys. And uh, the the nephrology, the um, and the kidney and the bladder system that can present at birth, and uh, we are very thankful indeed that our um, fetal med medicine unit, um, uh, our maternal fetal medicine unit, are able to diagnose most of these antenatally. Although sometimes we do, on occasions, do get the surprises where they are only diagnosed later um, after our birth. And um, uh, we have been seeing an increasing number of congenital mal malformations. I would say that um, uh, when it comes to pediatrics as a whole, partly because we are a tertiary referral center um, and these cases are being referred to us now. And quite a number of these conditions can be managed um, uh, either uh, from by our pediatric nephrology uh, colleague, like from if we were to refer early to Prof. Kamila, as well from uh, by our pediatric urology colleagues like um, uh, Mr. Hari, uh, Prof. Shireen, and the team from pediatric surgical uh, department. Uh, so I must say that most of the time, when it comes to congenital anomalies, um, it requires a multidisciplinary team effort uh, in ensuring that uh, everybody um, gets the best care, okay? And that the patient gets the best care. Um, uh, I think that's all. Um, uh, just a last note from Mr. Hari where he mentioned about uh, bedside ultrasound and a 72 hour postnatal ultrasound care scan will do for 95% of the anomalies. So that's actually basically to try and say that not everybody needs a CT scan. Um, uh, so the, the uh, bedside ultrasound, um, if you're skilled um, in conducting this, you may also 
um, diagnose this uh, confidently. Okay, um, uh, with that, I say since there are no more questions and no more comments from the audience, I'd like to uh, thank our two speakers, um, uh, Associate Prof. Dr. Kamila Abubakar and Dr. Chan Kokju uh, from the Department of Pediatrics for their great talk. Um, uh, so, and uh, do get your e certificate for CBD points by filling in the form that's actually enclosed in the chat box. Okay, thank you very much.